Hello, YouTubers. This is another session in our podcast series where we get to go all over the world and, you know, interview and talk to some inspiring figures in the tick industry. In this session, I will be talking to Mr. Nick Craver. Is it Craver or Craver? Craver. Craver. What, Not this Carver, part? as what, most what, of what, my phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> for for the people for the people who don't know Nick, he's very very he's very very popular in the engineering community. Uh, this guy lives and breathes engineering. He loves optimizations. He likes to make things super fast. He was you know one of the pioneers that are leading a lot of technological advancement in Stack Overflow. Ever heard of it? Yeah. Next time you use Stack Overflow and your post goes right away, you can, you know, give a shout out to my main man, Nick, right here. And Nick, Nick recently, just about a few months ago, you know, he decided to come join us at Microsoft. And, you know, he's making Azure super fast, you know, just knowing that this brother just joined, you know, Microsoft, you know, now for a fact that Azure is going to be faster, more optimized, you know, a lot nicer experience to work with than anything that have ever happened. And we're always evolving technologically and just finding a great talent like Nick, you know, is something that just makes me really proud to be a part of Microsoft as well. You know, like, you know, Nick and I are in the same company, believe it or not. This is great. This is crazy, right? Yeah. And, and Nick, do you want to, do you want to tell people a little bit about yourself? Introduce yourself to the world, okay? No assumptions. I know you're famous. Just tell them anyway. Tell them I, I am Nick. Infamous <laughs> may be the right word. Um, yeah, I've been doing this for, uh, I guess, since I was like 14 or so professionally. Um, not this specifically. Like, you know, I grew up doing uh, tech support for doctor's offices and hospitals. And, nice. you know, I had um, opportunities early on to get you know sysadmin work with that kind of stuff and then went into programming uh, a little bit later right um, mostly due to my my grandfather worked at uh lucent and at&t stuff mm -hmm. um you know it, it, things you take for granted and you yep. love seeing how they go underneath right you pick up a phone yep. it just works yep. uh, he worked yep. in the department where it was like uh what is a volt right yeah you say yep. like this takes how many okay who controls a volt who maintains that a volt is exactly this? There's a whole fleet of people who do just that, you know? Mm -hmm. How much is a kilogram? And they go compare them. So he did all the standards and that kind of stuff was involved. And I always thought that stuff was fascinating, right? How do you make the base level work to build things on top of? Mm -hmm. And so from early on, I, I love doing that. We did uh, college contracting, um, did the medical for a while, and then mm -hmm. medical uh tech for medical rather and then mm -hmm. uh, ended up at stack overflow for about 10 and a half years i guess did you did you were you like one of the founding fathers did you like when you joined stack overflow how many people were there uh i was 20 30 50 in that range i don't know actually oh there's God. a um there's a mm -hmm. thing somewhere for this i can tell you uh I'm trying to find out how many employees are in Stack Overflow. So, okay, so Stack Overflow has 21 million questions and 14 million registered users. Oh yeah, when I left, it was like two to 300 employees at the time. Nice. Um, nice. The only and you know I, I never count. I never look at my own stuff that much. Yeah, how old am I? I do the math every time. And the mm -hmm. caching mm -hmm. screws you, right? <laughs> um, the uh, <laughs> things like Stack Overflow. You know, I remember that over 600 people came and left while I was there. That's that's the oh, numbers wow. you, you remember. And, and, you yeah. know, half the company's sales. That's not yeah. just- No, yeah, of course. You, you know, gotta, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. all of engineering was like 60 people or something to that magnitude. And, you know, the team I'm on now is, they said, don't, it's a small team in Azure and it's 300 people. And I'm like, what the, come on. <laughs> Mike, it's Mike, huge. Microsoft has around 200,000 people. We have a quarter million you know, human beings on the planet operating. I'll, I'll tell you something interesting about Microsoft. You know, at Microsoft, you know, you know, you know, Microsoft Office, we hit the market cap like there's nothing else we can do for Microsoft Office. Like we have full mm -hmm. dominance in that space. Even when Google went out there and said, here is Office tools for free. People were like, nah, we want to pay money for Office. <laughs> get this. It's just a weird, weird equation. And Google was like, what? You don't want free and the browser tools to use and they're like no <laughs> i want enterprise stuff you know there's a joke that's going around they say the entire world economy 
as a system is relying still on the Excel 97 engine. <laughs> it's just a very... It may not, may not be that new. Finance is running on Excel. Okay. So you, you started programming at 14. You know, you progressed. You ended up in Stack Overflow. And now you are a principal software engineer at Microsoft. Just for the people mm -hmm. on, who, who want to, like, watching this for the first time. So there's an engineer. Right, that's someone who can solve problems, debug, do all that cool stuff. Great, right? And then there's a senior engineer that's someone that can lead a team of engineers and kind of write features. And then there's a principal engineer, and a principal engineer is someone who cross works across teams and multiple principals to kind of coordinate and build features and innovate new ideas. That's where Nick is. That's a big deal. If you're a principal engineer at Microsoft, you know you are someone that Microsoft thinks that you are very, very trustworthy, and you have the the skill set that can carry you know, kind of big feature, especially for something like Azure, one of our biggest products out there. Nick, question for you. Mm -hmm. What excites you, man? What gets you up in the morning? What makes you, you know, you are very active on social media. You're, you mm -hmm. love programming. By the way, I have a little gift for you. You know, let's just uh -oh. see. I, actually, you know, let me give you the gift first and then we'll see what excites you. What do you think about that? Let me show you something funny. Is this like a com reference to debug or something? Like a cool <laughs> gift. That's what I was doing before this call. It's not. I was it's not I was, enjoyable. <laughs> I was playing around with with the OData folks. Do you remember OData technology? Oh, I remember OData. Right, right. <laughs> and and I'm rewriting it with a bunch of people, like literally from scratch. We're making it modular, pluggable, okay. all kinds of crazy stuff. Now watch this. So I, so usually when I write my test, I randomize, right? I go and I randomize things. So, you know, you never know what's coming from the other side as long as it has constraints. I want a number. It doesn't matter what the number is. And I kid you not, Nick, I didn't know that you could actually do something like that. Check this out. So you could actually go and do something like this, my friend. And that, you know, it's, you know, not, 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 not the empty string. I'm just trying to find the actual character for you <laughs> because, because I was like, wait a second, you could do that. You can actually pass in the um, you can pass in in the parse area. Ideally, you'd expect you'd expect to pass numbers as strings, so because you're parsing. But did you know that you could do this? Mm -hmm. There's a there's a few of those in there. I was hoping I could impress you by your you're just too smart. <laughs> There, there's a couple the ones that like really throw me off on some of that type of area is uh i, I need to find a a link to this it was a public talk barry dorans did um mm. mm. and it was you, you take a script injection attack right and some things that are helpful can hose you in otherwise so yeah. it was like if you have a double width character for utf8 to utf16 and it's a padded character so it's basically just a thing in a null for the next eight the next um eight bytes mm. going in mm -hmm. Or the next byte, rather. So when you're doing um, uh, like a script, like hello uh, alert faults or whatever you want to do to it, you pass in angle bracket SCRIP, like you're passing your JavaScript block to inject in a page, like an XSS attack, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you pass it in, you're like, no, that's that doesn't match because that's these weird characters that are double width spaced. If I say equals a script or looks like malicious stuff, no, 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 mm -hmm. it's just garbage. Mm -hmm. But then you pump it through the SQL driver and it will helpfully go, well, that can fit in UTF-8. And oh we'll just put it God. in there. And it'll bring it back as a script attack. And you're like, what? No. Like, those dogs, I'm just like, wow, 10 years. I haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Of people here are nuts. Back to you. Let's talk about the compiler of Nick Craver. What gets uh -oh. you up in the morning, brother? What's your fire? You know, I just want to tell you something first. You know, I share mm -hmm. these videos with people that just about to enter the industry. Right. Uh -huh. And the idea here is that I want when you learn from someone else's experience, you could share something in here in a minute that could save someone five or 10 years of searching yeah. and, and looking around. Let's start from from the top. What excites you? Why do, why do you write programming every day? Go ahead. I, I like making things more efficient, right? How do you how do you give people um, the the way I uh, think about it, at least internally? I don't know if I've really done a talk or anything about it, but like you, you get a moment, right? Is how I tend to phrase it. You you look at like what we are here, right? You're in a little bitty marble in the middle of nowhere. You zoom out, we're literally speck, and yeah. you know the universe is what we think four or six billion years old or something, ever growing, ever expanding. You get yeah. a little little piece of that. Yeah. How do you give people a little bit bigger piece of that? And you do it by making the time they spend more efficient, whether it's a programmer and their 
able to do things more efficiently, right, in terms of getting their day job done. But that enables them to make other people's lives more efficient, right? Oh. So writing stuff for programmers allows you to double multiply out as a, you know, your force multipliers two levels away, not just what can I do to help people, which was Stack Overflow, right? How do you enable programmers? Yeah, that was the appeal is yeah. if I can make you better, yeah. you can yeah. do more for other people. Yeah. And yeah. that's a huge, I don't care if you know my name. I don't care if anyone remember I know I helped you. That's enough for me. Yeah. Um, and I think this is the best way I found to do that. If I found a better way, I'll go do that. Oh my God. So you're basically oh. saying to you, making things more efficient and more optimum faster mm -hmm. is is your way of giving someone back a portion of their time that they would have wasted anyway waiting for this thing to finish oh yeah no God. one likes waiting you want to play with your kid or go do something fun or watch a movie who cares you don't want to be it's waiting beautiful. on anything that we build none of it you want to be waiting on i mean we got some cool loading animations don't get me wrong but <laughs> like you're the, when we install Windows, I'm going to get in trouble for this. You remember when we installed Windows like 10, the first came out, and it's like, don't worry, everything's right where you left it. And it was yeah. pulsating yeah. characters, and it was the, the most unsettling combination of things you could possibly do, and they reverted that. I was like, that's like that's probably the worst thing to wait on ever. But The, the, the fading <laughs> high will almost there. It's like... I, I read somewhere that they said they tested like pulsating colors, like very gentle was soothing and messages were soothing. But I don't think anyone like tested them together as an integration test because that was unsettling <laughs> as hell. <laughs> that was just really do, you know, like, do, do, is this malware? Do, is my stuff being encrypted? <laughs> do you remember 98, Windows 98 installation where it used to play like rock and roll music in the background? The part that a lot of people are scarred by until today is that it reaches 99% and then be like, ah, system failed. Sorry, we can't install Windows 98 anymore. Oh, <laughs> I never hit that personally, but I saw so many. We had a, um, we were ever getting a server at Stack, turns out to be a blown power supply. But mm. you go to, we're like, all right, we had, it was uh, upgrading a data center in the middle of a blizzard. So we just stayed all night. And we said, because they shut down the trains to go back to the New York City. We were in Jersey. So you're and, just uh, there. We're just there. We're like, we'll just work all night. It's just easier. So <laughs> then we were like, all right, last thing, we're going to update the BIOS in this machine and then we're going to go out, which is probably the bad decision. So we just sat there and it's like five, and it gives you a five minute upgrade time for BIOS and it's mm -hmm. like the machine should reboot by then. Mm -hmm. So at about, you know, 15, 20 minutes, you start getting really worried. Yeah. 10 minutes past that timer. Yep. And then it yep. finally did reboot. We're just like, oh, God, this new machine we'd racked, stacked. I just put 16 drives in. <laughs> yeah. So you actually you actually did hardware, too. You like hardware, too. You're not just fully. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, nice. Hardware networking. Over there, I would help uh, spec order the servers. In New York, uh, I racked most of them when we, when we or sorry, uh, cabled most of them we moved. You have to have a union company move them. Nice. Um and uh, I find that you can, that, that's a little weird here, right? In, in Azure, there's a layer of magic. Um, mm -hmm. I'm in a team that's on top of the magic, the Azure okay. uh, app services is where yep. I'm working in functions and we run your app for you kind of thing. Serverless, they call it. Uh, there are servers, spoiler, uh, that there, you can't see them, right? It's like, I have a networking issue. I have a throttle. I have a, a, a quota I'm hitting. What are those things? How do they work? And so some of the conversations I have are reaching out to other teams to, to learn that that's the main reason i came here is to learn yeah, because yeah. you get the most senior somewhere among the most senior in mm -hmm. my case and your learning slows it just yeah. does right people yeah. are like what yeah. was wrong with stack like, nothing's wrong with stack i highly recommend working for stack i have a lot of awesome friends yep there but right you're now. growing you're diversifying you're learning I want and to you're learning. you know this is one of the things that scare me the most like you know i change orgs within microsoft when i get too powerful or too comfortable because that mm -hmm. basically means i hit that ceiling and there's nothing else right some yeah. folks might say oh chill out dude just rest and vest i don't know how to do that because as long as i'm still eager to learn i think it's yeah. better for me to move around and kind of learn about new things now the other thing I wanted to ask, okay, so you're you're in the app service functions. Here's here's a question a lot of people mm -hmm. ask me all the time. When yep. do you when do you use functions and when do you use app service? I have no idea. <laughs> I just have the back end, man. I just no. I, I just make um, it work. I don't know. I <laughs> I, I build that stuff. I don't know how to use it. it. Uh, so, <laughs> so the I mean functions is what you're what you're not supposed to care about is how your code runs. You're just like, here's my thing, run enough of it fast enough 
for what I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a continual iteration of how mm -hmm. do you how do you do that? Mm -hmm. As far as the product side, I honestly I've been here five months, but I can't intelligent, intelligently <laughs> case in point intelligently speak about it uh, from what the front end should be, right? I'm focusing. There's so much here in terms of from what the front to the back is in terms of infrastructure and and yeah. priorities and. Uh, sometimes code functions is open source. So anyway, yep. this is, you can see the functions repo and the workers and all on GitHub. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's great. Unless you're a Microsoft employee on a personal device with SSO, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> so the, uh, the, you know, with functions, you can work on it in the open. I've got PRs out in the open for some of the perf stuff, some of its paper cuts, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, when you're running small things that need to fire up and go fast, that's typically functions is app services, more of a long lived, uh, application that keeps running, right? But on it, there's probably like a thousand <laughs> more <laughs> informed takes on that on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't take my word for it at all. I can tell you how the back end runs, uh, roughly. But yeah. Just just for people just watching, when you say front end, you're talking about the back end for other people. It's true. Okay. Yeah. So what you see in the portal or when you push, that's my front end. And the back end is like <laughs> secret sauce of craziness. So just um, so you guys know, this app service, that's what we, when we build enterprise systems, we say, oh, your API, that's your back end. That's the front end for Nick. <laughs> yeah, we, we run your code, which is like all sorts of interesting, right? Because people, and you know, people are like, oh, I run my .NET app services. They run .NET, they run Java, they run Python, they run JavaScript, everything. they run everything. It's, uh, yeah. you know, and how do you, how do you manage all these payloads and images and versions? And it's, it's a, when, the more you think about it, it is a large encompassing thing. I'm amazed the team this small uh, does is nearly as much as they do with app services, but they continually improve it. And I'm trying to help right now. I'm working on like the project system and things and getting it completely uh, on all the latest and greatest stuff to help that team move faster to do what they do, right? Nice, um, nice. And, uh, you know, people are like, ah, MS Build's boring, which is what I'm working on the past week or two. I'm like, eh, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. This benefits somebody. Who yeah. Who cares? It's, it's work. I don't know. Right? It's, not, it's not boring. I'm, it's I'm not boring to you. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, Nick, Nick let, me, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Where do, when you're trying to find an innovative solution, Mm -hmm. What's your mantra? What's your ritual? What do you do when you're thinking about a problem? How do you approach a problem? Uh, uh, so there's a couple things I look at. Um, first, uh, when I'm looking at a thing that is not the way you want it to be, I don't mm -hmm. approach it as a problem. I approach it generally as an opportunity. Like this may or may not be a problem, right? Mm -hmm. I can make this better, but is it an actual problem today? Is it bugging anybody? Or mm -hmm. are there a better place to send my time, right? So problem versus opportunity is a priority decision in my mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I hear people complaining about this, bugging about this, why am I messing with the project system? Because I went to add a reference and it was a royal pain. And I said, this could be better. As a new user coming in, this seems weird to me. Because it's mm -hmm. more of a, this particular thing was a legacy thing that has been brought over the years. Because App Services is ten years old now. That's right. Um, and this I know will affect new people. I know people are being onboarding. That's that's problem. First is like, is it a problem? That's the first thing you step through, right? And then it's always, have I seen this before? Have I seen things like it before? And then I consult. You know, I Google a ton more than anybody. But also, mm -hmm. you know, friends. What do they think? What are they? What are you seeing in this area? When I'm seeing mm. a are you seeing a a specific problem like hey this in .NET the stopwatch does X is something we we're talking about yesterday or the string builder does Y that's a problem in a very specific right right mm -hmm. if you say hey this thing is uh, having a lot of allocations due to logging is something me and some other people that uh, some other stackers have come Microsoft and back over the years uh, something they're seeing right this is a example of a wider problem. So that's mm -hmm. something to recognize, right? Because if you have four of you individually solving the same problem, that is a humongous waste. The efficiency first comes in, how do you team up to solve that thing better, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So talk to other people you think might be having the problem. And if they're not, even that's valuable because why are they not having it, right? They do something similar. How are you doing it? Did you mm -hmm. just, do you have a solution I can lift over here? Or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, do you just completely design around this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. um, and then you just go about how do you, how do you chip away at it, right? People look at like, performance, right? They go mm -hmm. in and they debug and they're like, I got to find something that makes 50% faster. Mm -hmm. ah, ah, that's 1%. Ah, that's 3%. Ah, that's 2%. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Add those up. It's 80%. 
it's like a lot of people will leave the little stuff and keep going. They're like, this is little stuff. And it's you can different. come and just kind of cut out all of that keep and be like, this it up. Nice. paper cuts is what I call it, right? They, these things don't show up in a profiler often. They don't, yeah. um, your traces and performance and all. A lot of people don't fully understand what a, a profiler is telling them, right? Mm -hmm. they, they think mm -hmm. it's, hey, this is where my CPU is spending the time. No, no, no. That's where the time lapse camera, that's what it called in frame. Yep, yep, and yep. That is yep, not yep. the same as where you're spending the time. So we get these bugs filed on Stack Exchange Redis, for example, it's a library that me and Mark Gravel maintain. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, uh, people are like, oh, this thread's locked all the time. We're like, no, it's waiting for work. It's fine. That's the, the profile is like, this is 50% of my CPU. I'm like, I assure you it's not. It's just sitting there. We actually tried to eliminate it, but there's a, a gotcha. So just just because of the bugs filed against it, we tried to remove it. We're like, if we can get equal perf by removing this, great. But we mm -hmm. couldn't. Um, so yeah, how do you, is it a problem? Is it a priority? Is the other thing, right? There's there's a million things to fix. There's always a million things to fix. Yeah. Is this worth to do? Um, yeah. And then there is there is a amazingly simple insight that I uh, Ian Cutrus is a great uh, follow. He's a he does CP, CPU. He's a, mm -hmm. a PhD. Was with Anantech. I'm not sure actually where he's headed next. Yeah. Um, he's uh, Intel, AMD, and follow all that stuff. But uh, he does interviews, some awesome interviews, and one of them was with Jim Keller from he's in Intel, AMD, and other places. And they said, "How do you how do you take a break? How do you you know keep on top of stuff?" And he's like. When I find something I don't want to be doing, I find somebody who wants to do it more than I do. I take off. <laughs> nice. And I'm like, and a lot of the stuff that I work on and the other people work on, you find it boring. They find it interesting. Interesting. Well, That's right. Hell, get together. You go have a better time doing something else. They will, t and they can ping you for learnings across, but they have a better time. They get opportunities and you can go spend your time while you're happy and you both win from this, yep. right? It's, it's not a just a, hey, I'm giving yep. you my work. They want it. And uh, it's amazing when you're doing this stuff that you're like, oh, this is monotonous. No, no, no. This is something this these hundred people have never seen before. Mm -hmm. They want to mm -hmm. learn about this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, that little thing, and I found that every time I do find myself doing something boring, which isn't often, yeah, I'm like, yeah, turns out there are 20 people who would rather be doing it. And it, that goes from programming to making slides about something or whatever, right? Because they get to yeah. go dive in and dig. And as an excuse, it's like, you've approved their time funding for this thing. Yeah. Because an yep. ask came from a more senior person. Sometimes yep. that's the dynamic. Yep. Yep. I don't fully understand people. <laughs> um, but that's just a, such a simple notion. And I'm like, damn, that's <laughs> what somebody said that like eight years ago. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this. When is, when is enough is enough when you're optimizing? When do you say, I think this is enough. Do you set goals for yourself before you start solving a problem and say, I want to bring this down by 25% time consumption, asymptotic time, whatever you call it, Nick, you're a very smart guy. But, you know, the or or do you go and say, let's see how much I can cut out of this and whatever I can cut. Like sometimes like I know someone, you know, in, in my uh, social group that like doesn't know when to stop like to him mm -hmm. he will go and optimize something 85 percent and he will release a pull request and say draft and i'm like why draft he's like because it's only 85 percent i'm like dude do you want to travel through time like do you want to go back in time when the <laughs> server executes what do you want he's like there's more yeah. there's always more and i was like wow when do you when you when do you call it off and say okay this is enough for me go ahead I, I just chip away at the problem, right? And the so the functions case is one that's in public, so you can go see it. Um, you know, there's there's things, there's stopwatch allocations, there's logging allocations, there's dictionary allocations, there's how we wrap a timer, how we so when a function comes in to run, uh, you can set a timeout, and to enforce that timeout, a timer is started with the function. And then at the when it's told to fire the timeout, it will fire. And a lot of people do that pattern. They set a timer and you wait for one or the other. And whichever mm -hmm. one finishes first, the function or the timer, then you return back and say it timed out. I don't know what's happening. By the mm -hmm. way, it doesn't kill in the process. It just keeps running, which if you're in process, that's always what happens because that's the limit of the OS. But in those cases, what will be more efficient is a rolling timer every 50, every 100 milliseconds or whatever that just evaluates a list and if any are timed out then execute not a timer per right these mm -hmm. are bigger changes is it worth mm -hmm. doing i don't know right it's how easy is this to maintain when you start making maintainability trade-offs for it 
it needs to really be worth it. Your bar starts going up a lot, right? So if yeah. you say, hey, this could be more efficient, but I'm using fixed buffers and pointers to manipulate my string arrays and I'm doing yeah. unsafe marshalling, I'm like, okay, what are the, what number of devs have I shrunk to be able to maintain this code? And that's probably not acceptable trade-off, right? When inside yeah. your team. So yeah. that's generally when you want to stop given no other constraints. The reality for most people was I have other priorities to get yeah. to. Right. That's Everyone's right. got priority driven development is that actually what everyone uses. Forget what they tell you. Test driven. It's all priority driven development. So uh, to, like do by Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, <laughs> at Stack, you know, uh -huh. from Atwood at the beginning to now, it was always performance mindset. It was ship, 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 ship. Right. Uh -huh. um, and not like, hey, you're being driven to ship, but just let's keep iterating and go. And so, you know, you get one percent win. Do it. Two percent win. Do it. And, you know, my rules are. You don't have to optimize the crap out of the thing. You don't have to design a thing all the way to the end. Yep, you just need to yep. not back yourself into a corner. That's where don't you stop, right? Is this, yep. Yep. is this thing going to be extensible later for what I need? You know, some people build this thing to be like extensible yep. in, in 500 directions. Like, yep, yep. It doesn't have to be. The Over-engineering. Over-engineering. Yeah. People were like, ah, but this interface. I was like, yeah, and that interface, you simverd, you're going to break immediately to actually extend the thing, right? Don't <laughs> um, don't interface or API your first use case, right? Mm -hmm. Do, uh, I, I'm a firm believer you need two or three use cases of a thing before you say this is design. any kind of, because, you know, APIs organically grow and most systems that have a lot of decay in them, you'll see that organic growth. Uh, if right. you would have waited for a couple versions before you publicized anything, Almost always there are corrections or changes, right? Um, but yeah, how do you stop is more of when do the trade-offs add up? Everything's a trade-off. Everything. Your time looking at is trade-off, right? Yeah. Uh, people really need to cognizant of that. And the other thing that like helps you balance that, I think, that all developers need to stop and do before they before you write a line of code, before you look at anything, any professional ever, what is your time worth? Yeah. yeah. You need to know that. What like an actual dollar value. Yeah. To an hour of your time. Would yeah. you rather be watching TV? Would you rather be at a movie? Would you rather be at a game? Would you rather pay for a vacation? Would you rather do whatever? And what's a, if you're like, okay, people make this decision, but they don't really think it through completely, right? Okay, I want to, I want to buy a mower and mow my yard, and that's mm -hmm. that's extra cost. Or I want to have someone mow my yard. That's yeah, yeah, that's, that's a it. homeowner decision, right? Yeah. What is your time worth? Is an inherent part of that. Yeah. Thing. For yep. me, I think I, we have someone more our yard because I can spend that time on open source and enable a much better net good, I think, mm -hmm. from my hours. Maybe that's a wrong assumption or not, but figure out what your time is worth per hours. If you were to consult for somebody, what are you, what are you asking for per hour? That's that value. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, you know, that's plus your, what your time is worth. Yeah, know that because it's yeah. like, okay, I'm going to spend four more hours optimizing that. Is that okay? Or am I um, am I going to pay this much in a cloud bill or something over the next two years? Right. Well, hell, that's not worth an hour of my time, for that example, right? Yeah. Having that value um, on a stable currency uh, is a good <laughs> idea, I think, for lots of reasons. Let, let me ask you this then. You know, okay. So, 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 you know, you, you have particular forces that play a big role into determining how far you want to go, you know, mm -hmm. consider, and, and it's really, actually, I want to tell you this, it's very thoughtful. You know, this is, this is professionalism. This is, this is software craftsmanship. When you think about how much my time is worth and whether I should be investing in this or that, because there's a lot of fun things that you want to do, right? But whether it's mm -hmm. worth it or not. Okay. The next question for you here, okay, you know, you know, you're, you have a stop and all that. What do you think about, you know, the idea of, you know, hitting the market? You know, you're just getting something out there, and then we can incur, take debt, and kind of fix things later. There's, there's a lot of this, you know. This is a, just a, you've been around, you've seen this a lot, you know. Oh, let's just get, let's just get out of the door, and then see what we can do. And I, and it's also a trade-off. Like, you know, the obvious thing is that you go and say, well, you know. It's Tuesday, you know, we need to go out there and do something. Do you yeah. care more about being right than being done? Or do you want to be done and then later on being right? Or do you want to balance? And what are these constraints that makes you think this way? So all priorities, right? Uh, I was at a startup. Your choices are make money or die. Okay. That's your, that's yep. your choices, um, yep. right? Um, you do yep. this or everyone goes home tomorrow. Yep. 
Yeah. Bad example. We were all remote, but um, <laughs> with all of the all the things in play like that, right? It's like okay, uh, a, a lot of people have the best, cleanest code you've ever seen that never shipped because the startup shut down because they never sent anything. Like that yep. exists. That exists. Yep. There's a lot of what is it like? Nine out of ten companies fail or something like that. Or Twitter. Twitter has this problem. They care more about they they are the de facto for Scala. You know that they love functional programming languages and. Mm -hmm. They care more about being right than making revenue. Twitter you loses money, you know. But yeah. if you go to if you go to a standardization, it's very hardcore engineering in there. But uh, but again, back to you. What mm -hmm. priorities? So uh -huh. If you're like, if you need to sustain the business, you have to ship this. Then you go for shipping. You have to be willing to clean up that tech debt, or it will eat you alive, though, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Walking through tar is a good way, of, I think, of phrasing it. Yeah. So when you're, you know, each change becomes exponentially more expensive over time, right? You don't have tests, change become riskier. You don't have easy to manipulate code. Every feature becomes harder. You have more things that interact and are tightly coupled. Every feature becomes harder to build, right? All of, I mean, the tech debt things are something everyone's seen. Well, everyone has heard about tech debt and see it. And either you've seen a system completely mired in it or you don't fully respect it, right? Yeah. You, there's things you're just like, okay, it's... um like a really bad analogy is like, you know, you see how bad like a car crash can be like, mm -hmm. no, you hear it, you see it, but like being there in person and seeing the thing is like, no, that's a different experience. And it just, it burns you. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, your decisions, and this is why like diversity and things are like, you don't have to convince me about that. That is a wholly important part of any process because you want to have a lot of people in the room with different experiences to have those insights for various mm -hmm. areas of how you're building something, how you're extending it, how you're designing it. Right. Um, this is really important from all different backgrounds and stuff to inform those kind of decisions. So when you're talking about, uh, you know, how do you balance these two things? Everyone brings their scars to the table, right? This is, this is how it didn't work out before. This is over optimizing for that kind of thing, or this is unmaintainable type of optimization. Either mm -hmm. you didn't optimize it and it's, you're drowning in severity issues from people mm -hmm. reporting or outages. How much headroom do I have? How many on-call alerts am I firing because I'm mm -hmm. out of resources? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's performance tech debt, right? And then um, you have all of that just, it's just all added together, right? So yeah. what is your, what problems are we facing today? What mm -hmm. problems do we think we're facing tomorrow? Yeah. And those are your, your things you plan for. And in, in my position, I've generally been tasked with, and given the freedom to do, I've had awesome bosses yep. for, yep. for like 20 years. I've had awesome bosses. My, I currently report to Blaw. He's fantastic. Yep. Um, uh, Teresa and Rene were my last bosses at Stack. They're great, right? And my job is generally to look out six months or 12 months and say, what's coming? And then prioritize my own time. I've I'm, I'm yep. very rarely been told what to do in the yep. past decade or two. Um, nice, nice. And that I just, my, my feedback has been they hadn't fired me yet and they seem to be paying me still. So I so guess it's going it must, all right. It must be working. <laughs> like I, I get either the glitch or it's going okay, right? Yeah. They haven't fixed the glitch yet. So uh, that I was my. You take my stapler. <laughs> yeah, and so I read. Um, uh, highly recommend. Of course, you've seen this book several times. Uh, Staff engineer, right? Is mm -hmm. a one of the first times that I read through and went. Oh, that's what principal engineers do. You're just supposed to go find and seek out the problems. And that's yep. far more true in Microsoft. Sack, it's yep. like your sample size is so small. I'm like, yep. Yep. I don't know what we're doing. They 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 changed the job titles at some point and I was a some principal or senior. I don't know. I just said, Can I stay architecturally? They're fine, whatever. <laughs> it didn't matter. But job sure. titles really when I was looking at changing jobs, job titles really do matter from okay. positions and all this kind of stuff. Like I didn't ever really expect it inside of stack because everyone was just developer for like years there too. I just yeah. never cared, but it really does matter when you're moving, moving companies and all. And I, I need to respect that now, but yeah. those yeah. kind of things have just find the work and go do it. I, once you join Microsoft, I was like, Oh, that's really what they mean because yep. Yep. no one's kind of telling me what to go do. I, you stay in sync with your manager and yep. you, you make sure that you're focusing on problems that, affect matter. people but so yeah. far it's just like i'm just hunting and killing things that are i perceive to be problems the manager's like yeah go nuts <laughs> go crazy um, we know what yeah, tips yeah, here yeah. and there but yeah it's awesome mm -hmm. i'll tell you this much though you know you know i you know i talked to a bunch of people you know I'm like oh my god nick craver is, is at microsoft i was like you know at, at this point in, in, you know at this level 
you know, there are some engineers that you don't have to tell what you tell them what to do. They just know they look at a system and be like, oh, let me go fix that. You know, it's like I think of it as a an engine that's running and there's something that's clunky in the back that's making too much noise. And I'll be like, oh, I'll just go fix that. You know, of course, everybody wants, you know, the, the power of that, Nick, I call I call folks like yourself entrepreneurial engineers because you're not just looking at the engineering problem. You're looking at the business in general and you're saying, here's where we can make impact and expectation of principal level engineers but you know coming in innately and natively and organically with you it's it's really really uh, really a pleasure nick let's let's step away a little bit from technology okay. right what do you do when you're not writing code uh with open source that's not a huge so like this week i kind of booked monday off and went to mm -hmm. smash my old deck where I, i've had i've had lower back issues for mm -hmm. years and years and years mm -hmm. probably from skiing or falling down the stairs one um laundry baskets and not visibility hard hardwood kids. And socks. not a good very combination kids keep and getting heavier and heavier naked. <laughs> do they, they do right one of the saddest things that someone ever told me was like what's the saddest realization you have and it's like at one point i put my kids down and never picked them back up again yeah like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, that's not cool um <laughs> I, I need to go to the gym <laughs> they need tickles yeah. well, no but i mean just like as they get older at some yeah, point I know. you set them yeah, down I know, and you're like that's a freaking sad uh but um i like construction demo my dad built houses for 25 years or so so like i need to go over to my grandfather's and do uh he's got a well pump that needs replacing and a generator needs a new carb those kind of mm -hmm. things like i like hands-on um sometimes 3d printing and catting um those kind of deals uh jeff dagas is at microsoft who got me in, involved in 3d printing nice, <laughs> nice. how much money that's cost yeah uh, but like <laughs> You know, for the rack printing um, things for Raspberry Pi, uh, yeah. I've got another twenty gig network kit to install in that box. You know, nice, nice. these kind of you don't need this for your house, by the way. This is just, <laughs> just a fun. vice at this point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, like, I do technology outside, um, open source outside of Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, in personal time and things. Yeah. But mainly, I like getting my to-do list done, whatever it is, right? Yep. I don't care if it's ordering something or, you know, the dog needs to go to the vet, whatever, like checking that box off is just the satisfying part. I don't care what it is. If it's, I need to knock down the deck, if I need to build, the reason we're doing a deck, sorry, is to put a, a tub on for, you decompress your back is a huge, I didn't realize yeah. this till recent yeah. past two years. My wife and I have gone somewhere where it has a, a tub twice and you, you just, your back decompresses. Like I feel immensely better the next two days and i can get back to, to yeah. running and hiking you know that's that's, yeah. that's uh hiking with her i don't i don't go normally um those kind of things are like just i don't idle well yeah you know a lot of people are like that they just i i, I couldn't I, I couldn't tell you know i, I will say you know nick seems like <laughs> just chillax for a second I, I know I really I really appreciate your energy. You, you know, you're just a pulse of energy. So there's some spark in you that makes you always, you know, out there doing something, no matter what this something is. Do you use anything specific to organize your to-do list, or is it all up here? Uh, usually in my head, but honestly, once I started, um, Microsoft To Do is actually like I love really Microsoft well To Do implemented. I, I never it. used it before I joined. Did you um, know it's it's ing integrated with your mail? You can just literally yeah, Outlook and all is in there. I'm using a super secret thing I can't mention yet um, for for mail and all, right? And so it, it's integrated in there, but also you know, and I keep it separate. At Stack, yeah. I was on call effectively for ten and a half years. So Stack had on call, mm -hmm. and I was always available as escalation because I just knew wow. how all the, all the pieces you're always at DRI, always. <laughs> uh, well, I ran the vast majority of the incidents. Um, yeah. Yeah. Calls some of them to be fair, uh, yeah. but the the outages were always not always, but very often run by me. And so the my last six months or so there is very important. I I just was hands off completely. Like call me if you want me to join the thing. I was hands off. So when I joined Microsoft, I have a different phone that stays nice. in my office. Nice. When I leave this room, you can't reach me. You're out. But eventually, I'll be on call. I think here, but um, <laughs> you will. And uh, yeah, you know, so, I mean. <laughs> This but I was of, always on call there. So, this this buddy of mine, Todd Ostermeyer, he, I love him to death. He's one. Of, he's a principal engineer as well. He you know he handles commerce side of things, mm -hmm. and his on call tone is this. Uh, is it Star Wars? Star Wars, the ship, the you know the. <laughs> <wah>. <laughs> 
was like, what? Is this the Empire music coming in? Yes! <laughs> like, why do you do that to yourself? It's like, well, you know, it's disturbing. <laughs> Just, it's it's <laughs> disorienting. <laughs> That's what it is. Pingdom coming in. There's, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what on calls here like yet. Uh, honestly, I can't. They, I went through. You go through a boot camp when you're doing. There's a couple of boot camps. The Azure boot camp. They accidentally broke while I was in it, so I couldn't actually see part of the on call screens. Great. They, they fixed it now, but for like the two days that I was in there, actually, they broke some access things. They, they, it's, you know, part yeah. of life. Systems change. Um. So outside of that, though, I try and disconnect. Like I. Some some days I'll stay a little bit late, but if it's outside of me, I'm East Coast, Microsoft mm-hmm. West Coast, right? Mm-hmm. So I can get some stuff done in the morning. And if there's a late night meeting, if it's an important like five to six or something, I'll stick around. But I try yeah. not to do it. But a yeah. a day or two a week at most. Yeah. Um. And generally, I try and clock out and go. Yeah. Because the you know, there's not a lot of time in the day. Once you have once there's kids involved, right? Yeah. Right now they've got soccer practice and all, yeah. and at least it's taking yeah. them to that so far. But I'll yeah. I'll probably have we'll have the games this weekend. Yeah. They did. They just started. Um. You've got their homework, and then. Yeah, yeah, and then at the end of the day, you're like, okay, I can, I'll code while we're figuring out what to watch, which yep. is that's, that's two hours of your day, right? Figuring out which of these five thousand shows you want to scroll through and not actually engage in. Um, if people have recommendations, like send them. We're we're out of stuff right now. I think sure. new are on. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah, how do you how do you spend your time outside? And I I feel like if you're idling or not doing much, like if my back hurts and I'm on a heating pad, then it, which has been more often than I like lately, that you know I try open source least something I can still do while I'm yeah. on it. Stack yeah. Change Redis has got a lot of love lately for that reason. Um, yeah, but otherwise, how do you how do you build things for people? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so here's one for you. Are yeah. you were you actually born in the in the East Coast? Mm-hmm. I was born about yeah. uh tonight, twenty fifteen minutes from here. Or so, so I moved east to Raleigh a little bit. In the, I'm uh-huh. about in the center of North Carolina, just but yep, yep. middle. Yep. Um, and so I was born in Winston, moved to Raleigh for uh, college. There's RTP over there. People mm-hmm. won't be familiar with Research Triangle Park. Worked mm-hmm. in for a mm-hmm. while with with mm-hmm. pharma, and uh, they did drug trials for cancer research and things. And then uh, moved back here because. At least was like, hey, you want a date? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So um, <laughs> then I, I can't make this way for a girl. Like, you know. so, 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 so let me let me ask awesome. you this. So you, so you grew up there. You know, you said Carolina, right? North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Okay. So your father was in, into construction. You know, yep. a lot of people. When I ask a lot of people what got you started in technology, they always say my dad, right? But I don't think it's the same for you. What got you started into software? You know, on technology in general. So definitely my grandfather. So he, yeah, the, okay. the one at the, like AT&T and Lucent, um, yeah. he does all sorts of, we would do, put stuff together in his basement from soldering whatever together, or, you know, he's down there right now with, uh, he's 92 or something. He's, he's, wow, he's nice. shocking batteries back to increase their capacity span and he's measuring it, you know, oh my each God. time and you're like, and you're like, just do spark shoot that every time. And I'm like, he's just never going to quit. <laughs> So, uh, you know, he's got like the, the dead man wire to connect a generator into the house. And very, of course, if you know what you're doing, it's fine. It's yeah. Not, you know, it is what it is for the way it's wired. Yeah. Um, not going to work to add a carb to it anyway. But <laughs> the, uh, you know, he would always, he showed me like from basic, the first stuff going into it. But also just, you know, I like shortcuts uh, for things. When I would go home from school, I would, I was at their uh, my grandparents' places where I just got to drop off from school while my parents were working for like at least a couple years there. And I'd watch like PBS and they had all the math shortcuts and advanced math stuff going on. Right. And when I was little, I could remember everything just like, I mean, yeah. people call it photographic or whatever. Like, yeah, just, most of my childhood is like HD video in my head. And then uh, I've had six concussions <laughs> since then. Skiing is dangerous. Oh, don't, yeah. don't ski in terrain parks with metal poles is my, yeah. After yeah. the fact, advice to you. Uh, now I now I don't have that anymore. I don't remember near as well. And I never learned how to learn. You like there's things you skip, and then you're yep. like, oh crap, what is the long I'm way? Supposed to learn how that. You... Yeah. Yeah. Or like, yeah. how do you learn? How do you memorize? How do you? That's yeah. not stuff I had to do when I was little, and I'm paying for it a little more in in life now, right? But a lot of that uh, interest for tech 
definitely comes from, from um, your grandfather grandfather building up a gateway pc right that damn turbo button on the button you remember you hit the right. turbo button and then the command and conquer map was over in like two seconds because everyone invaded yeah <laughs> i was okay. like How did that work? so what's what's your proudest moment you know technologically what's something that you built or did you know that oh boy yeah uh this is not your typical podcast, Nick. You know, there gonna be I some questions. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm always like, you know, when people are like, "What am I proud?" I'm like, Stack Overflow. It goes. It runs. It does what it needs to do. Right. Um, you know, we've done some open source that is it's good, and people seem to be using it. You know, some of those are approaching hundreds of millions of downloads. Right. And I mean, it's it's all about perspective because yeah, like I'm glad that stuff helped people, but when when somebody watches our kids and come back and say they had the best manners, that's, that, a, that's a win. Like nothing win. really yeah. compares to that. Like, yeah. Yeah. I just, yeah. I can't even think of an example that's even close. So yeah. when you think about tech, I mean like, yeah, I guess some of the stuff we've built that helps lots of people. I'm glad we did it. But in terms of being proud of it, I'm like, it's, it's still stuck in my head, man. I never saw yeah. someone describe optimization this way. I optimize software to give people back a little bit of their life so they can go do something else. This is gold. I have to tell yeah. you that. That's what we're doing. What's your favorite programming language, Nick? Uh, you, you said what well, you know, right? For me, it's uh, C Sharp right now. Um, okay. Go is interesting. JavaScript's interesting or masochistic, one or the other. Um, the, you have... <laughs> C sharp, I know more about the the thing, how it works, the underneaths, all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. There's pros and cons to absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. um, as far as it's weird because I'm dealing with other stuff now, right? One of the things that's slow in one of the services I got to figure out is like, how do you debug Python? I'm like, I don't know, but you showed yeah. me this number, and that's terrible, so I just got to figure it out. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but I. <laughs> I think it's just, what do you know, right? Which is a lot yeah. of people were like, this came up at Stack all the time or yeah. in, in blog posts and things. Why yeah. don't you switch to Node? Why don't you do Java? Why don't you? They're like, this is faster. Like, based on what? You can't just quantify that comparison. Like, there's a whole mm -hmm. myriad of stuff that's faster, better, slower. There's no library to do this. There's a ton of ecosystem around this or not that, right? That yeah. kind of things. Yeah. But it's like, what? why, why was Stack Overflowing.net? Because the original people building it knew .NET, and so oh, I, I didn't .NET know that. That was productive. Wow, yeah. I didn't and know that. Same thing wow, with startup, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh, Go with what uh -huh. you know. You will be far more productive in it than the ideal language. Even if you're like, "Oh, this is freaking ideal for this." It, it okay, doesn't but the matter. Knows it. No yeah, one can exactly. keep bugging. It's about I'm going to get people. more done with this. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Trade offs, right. right? Here's one. One more for you. What's something you would advise your young self with? And the reason for this question is that a lot of people always, what I love about Gen Z's, the Gen Zers, is that unlike us, you know, millennials, you know, I was born in 85. I don't know how old you are, but, you know, I think that I do look like a grandfather, though. But, you know, the, the you know, I, I think my generation really hated to read documentation. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want to ask yeah. anyone anything. We just wanted to kind of cowboy our way to the top. But Gen Zers, they really love to ask questions and seek advice. They're a lot, they're a lot smarter and they're more environment, you know, aware. And they do a lot of things that actually they're more frugal fund financially, you know. And uh, it's really interesting. A lot of people come to me and ask me this question. You know, some anybody born after two thousands, you know, I noticed like the common theme is that they come in and say, "What's what's a, what advice you want to give me?" You know, what's what's the documentation? What advice that Nick Craver has for the youngsters out there? Are we millennials? I'm I'm May eighty five as well. I don't have yeah, a decoder. Yeah, yeah we're millennials. So you're May you're May eighty five and I'm September eighty five. So you're, okay. you, right. you're 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 just four months older, you know, and we are apparently millennials. Yikes. When does that end? Like when is the millennial cutoff? 80... 19, 1980. 1980? And then yeah. it goes until I have no go, idea what the generations are. <laughs> like, like you, you stop being a millennial. You know, early early two thousand, you stop being a millennial. Early two thousand. All right. Yeah. I need a, I need a cap. You, you got to frame it. 
Engineer. <laughs> I need a engineer, chart for this. <laughs> engineer to your core. I can't believe you, man. You're you're like, something else. But anyway. Uh, they keep changing think? the naming scheme though, right? It's like Millennial <laughs> and then Gen X. I'm like, wait, how did this this is like Intel renaming processors, everything? Oh, now it's the gold <laughs> series. You're like, just call they're, it a number. They're treating it like uh, like burgers at McDonald's. <laughs> what do they call it these days? <laughs> I, I I think it's BS. I I don't I don't care. I think people grow in three different dimensions. I think people grow mm -hmm. physically. That's the obvious. And I think people grow, you know, mentally and spiritually, right? Like yeah. you'll find people with the emotional capacity to handle the world, and you'll find someone that is mature physically, mature mentally, have degrees, you know, at a leadership mm -hmm. position, but emotionally they throw a tantrum like a three year old, right? So yeah. so. I think it's BS in terms of generations, but what I'm really going for here is that your 20 year old self, well, I guess your 14 year old self, because you started really early. I, I yeah. started, I started hacking around at 16. I, you know, at 14, mm -hmm. I was, I was just trying to figure out why I'm here. <laughs> just some silly questions like, how do we come to be, <laughs> you know, and stuff like that. But what would you say to yourself, Nick? And to uh, people out there, mm -hmm. software development's not about tech; it's about people. Like everything we're doing is is if it's not for people, then what the hell are you building it for, right? His brother, and right that's there. uh, mm -hmm. it's you know people were like, oh, I can make this faster, I make this system, you know, better, smoother, whatever. It's like, okay, but who are you building it for? What do they want? What do they need? Um, and when you're building software, the development process itself is about people and coordinating, mm -hmm. building the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, when they're when they're doing the the deck on the house right now, one of the things we went through was doing a 3D render and talking about it. We were like, oh, that's so fancy. That's a no. It's so you're talking about the same picture. Yeah, that's yeah. fundamentally important for any process that you are imagining the same thing as them, right? Yeah, we have technology now to support sharing that picture before you go off and spend a mountain of work onto this, right? That's why yeah. agile is so much, that's why it's caught on. And I think it's a lot better methodology of yeah. making sure you're iterating towards the same picture and coloring. You get these sketch lines and yeah. then you're finishing out the painting rather than like, here's a painting. And you're like, that's the wrong continent, you know, uh, <laughs> kind of thing going on. But people, you're going to have to work with people. You have to meet with people. Um, whether it be like email or chat or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially the past couple of years, right? Like it's a trying time for a lot of people, mass families, people trapped in their house for a large amount of time. You know, uh, some, mm -hmm. sometimes kids are at school, sometimes not, but we had homeschool. Our Ian's first year, uh, he had kindergarten last year was starting it remote. That was very yeah. Fun, right. Yeah. <laughs> For some definition, <laughs> fun. Um, you know, and they they send instructions that a kindergartner can't read to start the class, and I'm like, you know, he can't read the instruction yeah. to do the to log in. Like, yeah. yeah, you have to stand there with him. You know, um, and you know now now he's he's fine. He's started out well, but those kind of things are like most of your time is interacting with people, figuring with out what people. you need, designing yeah. the thing. Writing code for me is a very small percentage of my time. Um, I think a lot of people Mostly start thinking this and like, interaction. Yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah. coding all the time. No, that's there's not there's, there's actually how this works. there's actually no honor in that. If you're coding all the time, you're a coder. You, you know, you're we, you know we have a name for it. We say code monkey. Like he doesn't think. He yeah. just writes code. Whatever people tell him to to write code, he does. And I always tell people this: know what you're writing and who you're writing it for. And then go ahead and implement. The implementation is the easy part. You know, a lot of people used to think, oh, coding is hard. No, actually, writing code that's actually useful to someone else, that's the hard part, I think. You know, and, uh, you know, I think optimization, you love optimization, don't you? You're, you're the optimization efficiency guy. You know, you love to just make things run fast. And this is a very rare skill set. And I think that's why nobody tells you what to do <laughs> because you just, you know, you know, you'll see a lot of people that say, oh, I want to build everything end to end. But you go and say, okay, give me this existing system with multi-billion users on it and let me make it much more faster and much more fun. Uh, just giving people back some time of their lives that they would have spent using that exist. Oh, my God, man. You're you're, you're great. I want to tell you that. Uh, thank um, you. It's, it's been fun here. Um, so no, go, ahead, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. The one thing I would add to that in terms of advice for yourself, that's not yeah. just people – sometimes take that as just coding. Yeah. It can be designing systems and everything else, right? You can have the best idea in the room, but if you can't convince anyone to come with you, 
none of that matters, right? People, the the attitude you're talking about earlier, like like people throwing a tantrum, like and you know, and somebody, uh, David Fulton was one of my mentors at Stack. He was mm-hmm. uh, a CTO for a long time there. Um, you know, he was awesome. And it's you you go for you have to understand that you don't you can push people into a decision and you can do that so many times, but no one's going to want to work with you. Yeah, yeah. Or you can say like, here's, here's where I think it should go that way. Here's all the counterpoints. And you have to be fully ready to accept Like, I don't have the best idea in the room yeah. or this idea isn't tenable. Here's what we go with. Right. And I don't yeah. mind telling you, I don't know that phrase is fine. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Yep. It's fine. Like yep. you'll hear this people, but really take that in. I don't know. is fine. I'm willing to help figure it out. Let's go, let's go find out. I don't even know who to ping, but I'll go research this, right? Those are good attitudes to have. Just thinking that you are presenting that you know things you don't just makes people not trust you or that's right. it's, that's it's not a good thing. You need to have people. That's why it's called a leader. Like you want to follow you, not someone at the back with a taser trying to get yeah. the decision. Yeah. You know, some management works like that at different yeah. places. Yeah. I haven't seen that here, right? It's management works. Uh, they call it uh, servant leadership. I think yep, at, yep, at Stack, yep, right? It's, how yep. do I enable you to, you tell me where we should go. Y'all are yep. on the ground. You know how this is going. Help you me. Hire, you hire smart people to tell you what to yeah. do. Right? I That's help them the... block you. I help prioritize. That's awesome leadership. Yep. And I maybe, maybe you need the reverse in other cases. I've yep. been lucky enough to be under that type of uh, person for a long yeah. time. Um, but yeah, like it's people top to bottom. Software's yep. whatever. It's an implementation <laughs> detail. That's Language, right. Language, stack, everything. And and the technology itself eventually will change. Like how we program machinery, you know, eventually will change by, by designing systems and interacting with people and looking after their benefit and what's most interesting and beneficial to them. That's definitely something that's going to stay for a very, very long time. Since the beginning of creation and innovation, you know, this is yeah. has been the target for every product. Nick? You are an awesome person. Thank you so very much for accepting to come on my podcast today. You know, you are an inspiration. I really appreciate your content that you put in, you know, Twitter, your 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 uh, your blog, the Imagineering, Software Imagineering. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. There's a lot of thought into that. But also thank you for making Azure faster. Thank you for, you know, helping countless number of people. I am I am technically a customer of your product because, you know, mm-hmm. what I do almost on daily basis, spin up an API and, you know, slap a Blazor UI on top of it and let's go and, you know, make some people happy building systems. So you're 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 at the core of that, you know, and a lot of people might not understand what you're doing, like especially non tech savvy, the muggles out there in the world, they <laughs> might just look at the look at what they'll be like optimization. What's that? You know, where's the buttons? Where's the where's the stuff? You know, <laughs> and, but uh, but you're definitely, you know, uh, much more impactful in a wider, wider range of things. Uh, and of course, you know, for for the people watching us, please, I'm going to drop some links for Nick's, you know, uh, a, 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 a blog and his Twitter account is, you know, are you on LinkedIn or no? Do you go? Do you use LinkedIn? You're not I a LinkedIn I'm guy. I'm registered. I think it was the <laughs> easiest way to apply for a job at Microsoft by submitting your thing. So I think I actually we bought it. we bought the darn thing. Hang on. So let just... me <laughs> let me make sure it says I work at Microsoft. It might be. <laughs> That would be embarrassing. Let me update that for you. Let me anybody. I work at Microsoft. Oh, we're good. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. Thank you so much, Nick. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And for the people watching us, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or compliments for Nick here, please feel free to drop a comment in the comment section. And don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe. Thank you so much, Nick. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, sir.